This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course on schemes, and will be about divisors on some Riemann surfaces, especially Riemann surfaces of degree zero or one. Um, so what we want to do is to um, look at the um, Riemann surfaces and look at divisors on them. So what is a divisor? Well, a divisor on a Riemann surface is just a formal sum, um, sum of Ni Pi, where the Pi are points on the Riemann surface. Um, now, if you've got a um, meromorphic function on a Riemann surface, What we can do is we can form a divisor on this meromorphic function. So, so we take the function to um, sum of ni pi, where ni is the order of the zero of f at pi. And ni less than naught means there's a pole. And the problem is for meromorphic functions, this sum is in general infinite. So we usually assume C is compact. So sum is finite. I mean, you can do a certain amount of stuff if you allow infinite sums, but then you're really doing analysis, not algebra. Um, so um, we have a, a, um, a map from meromorphic functions on a compact Riemann surface to divisors. And you can look at the divisor class group which is the group of divisors modulo principal divisors. So the principal divisors are the ones that come from meromorphic functions. So what, what this group is really telling you is suppose you're given a divisor. In other words, someone gives you some points with multiplicities. You want to ask, can you find a meromorphic function with exactly those zeros or poles? So let's look at a few examples. Um, so first of all, let's look at the case where the Riemann surface is just the complex numbers. Um, here, of course, meromorphic functions can have infinitely many poles and zeros. So we will just look at rational functions, which have only a finite number of poles and zeros. And there's a map from rational functions to divisors, which just takes any rational function to um, its zeros and poles count with multiplicity. And now we can work out the group of divisors, modulo principal divisors. And this group is rather boring. It's just the, the trivial group zero or one if you're writing things multiplicatively. And the reason is that if we have any divisor, say P1 plus P2 plus P3, n1, p1 plus n2, p2 plus n3, p3. We can obviously find a function with these poles or zeros. We just take z minus p1 to the n1 times z minus p2 to the n2 times z minus p3 to the n3, and so on. So, so every divisor is a, a, a principal divisor for rather trivial reasons. You notice this is related to the fact that the ring of polynomials on um, C is a unique factorization domain. So the primes correspond to the um, basic divisors Pi, and saying that given any finite collection of Pi, you can find a meromorphic function to it is very closely related to saying that given any primes, you can find a, a, a polynomial with um, ex exact, whose zeros correspond exactly to these 
to these points or primes. Um, so for the complex numbers, divisors are not terribly exciting. They're just all principal. Let's look at a slightly more interesting case. Let's take our Riemann surface to be the complex um, plane together with the point at infinity. So this is the Riemann sphere. And now meromorphic functions on C are just the same as rational functions. And now it seems we're just in the same case as before, but it's slightly different because now we've got this extra um, uh, possibility for devices that we're also allowed that the, the point at infinity um, to, to um, be part of a divisor. And now if we look at divisors, modulo principal divisors, this is no longer trivial. This is now isomorphic to Z. And that's because any divisor has a degree. So the degree of a divisor sum of n i p i is just sum of n i in Z. And now you know that um, the degree of any principal divisor is zero because any rational function has the same number of poles and zeros. So the degree of a principal divisor Principal. I always get the adjective and the noun mixed up. So the degree of a principal divisor is zero. So, so this is slightly different from the case um, of C because, because now the divisors modulo principal divisors become Z because there's this non-trivial obstruction to finding a rational function with given poles and zeros. Um, and um, you can also uh, do the same for any Riemann, any compact Riemann surface. So if C is a compact Riemann surface, we again find that the, that the, the degree of a principal divisor is equal to zero. So we get a homomorphism from divisors modulo principal divisors to Z, where, where this map is given by the degree. And this, this will be on to, um, but, well, we're going to have to investigate the kernel. So we've shown the kernel is trivial for the genus zero Riemann surface, C of the Riemann sphere. Um, and what happens for others? Well, we're going to look at um, elliptic uh, curves. Um, before we go on to them, let's just recall why the degree of a principal divisor is zero. The point is you can find the number of poles and zeros of any meromorphic function inside a region by integrating around a curve C, and taking one over two pi i of f prime of z over f of z dz. So this is for functions in the plane, but you can do something locally on any Riemann surface. So this is 1 over 2 pi i times the integral of d log of f of z. And this um, f of z log of f of z sort of increases by 2 pi i whenever you go around a, a zero. Um, and now locally, you can do the same thing on a Riemann surface. And if the Riemann surface is compact, then um, if you think about it, integrating along a curve containing the whole Riemann surface is the same as integrating around a curve containing just, just nothing at all. So, so this integral is zero for the, um, if, you, if, you, if you try and use it to calculate the number of poles minus zeros on the whole Riemann surface. So the number of poles is equal to the number of zeros. Um, now we're just going to look at elliptic curves. Which, um, well, we, we, we're being analysts rather than algebraists this lecture. So an elliptic curve is going to be the complex numbers modulo a lattice L. So, so we take a lattice L and we quotient out by um, the lattice and we look at meromorphic functions on this quotient. So we're looking at doubly periodic functions. 
on the complex plane. And here um, we might call the periods omega one and omega two, because why not? Um, so um, as before, we can find, um, we, we saw that the number of poles minus the number of zeros of a doubly periodic meromorphic function is zero, where of course we just count the zeros inside some fundamental region. And let's just do that explicitly for this case and see why it cancels out. So what we're doing is the number of zeros minus the number of poles will be the integral around this curve of be one over two pi i times the integral of f prime of z over f of z dz, where f of z plus omega one equals f of z, and f of z plus omega two equals f of z. And now if you look at this integral, you can see that this is equal to zero because um, um, this integral just cancels out with this integral because of this periodic condition. And this integral just cancels out with this integral because of this periodic condition. So we can see very explicitly that the number of poles and the number of zeros in, of an elliptic function are the same in a fundamental domain. Um, so um, now we ask uh, if a divisor has degree zero, is it the divisor of an elliptic function? Of course, we're taking the divisor, points of the divisor to be not, not in the complex plane, but in the complex plane modulo a lattice, and um, an elliptic function is doubly periodic function, is, is doubly periodic, so it is a well-defined divisor on, on, on this quotient. And it turns out, um, that there's an extra obstruction. Not, not only must the degree be zero, but um, also the sum of the poles minus the sum of the zeros must be zero. So, so, so let's see why that is true. What we do is we look at the following integral. We look at the integral of z times f prime of z over f of z dz. Um, and um, here what we're, we're integrating over the boundary of a fundamental domain of the, of the elliptic function. Um, if the elliptic function happens to have poles or zeros on this red path here, we have to shift it slightly, but we won't worry about that. It's just a minor technical point. Um, and um, let's think about what this is. Well, this function here has residue um, n z, so let, let's, let's call this n p i at z equals p i if um, f has a zero of order um, n i at p i where of course poles count as zeros of negative order. That's because this thing here has a, has a residue of, of one at a zero of order one. And so you just have to multiply it by that. So the integral of this over a fundamental domain will be sum of n i p i, uh, at least one over two pi i times that will be sum of n i p i. So um, however, if we try looking at this integral, the integrals over the lower and upper parts no longer cancel out because z is not doubly periodic. So, so let's see what actually happens. Um, so um, so we, we, we've got these points naught, omega one, omega two, and some of them. And if we look at the integral along here, minus the integral along here, um, what we get is um, the, z, the z's almost cancel out. So here, 
z is omega 2 more than the z here. So what we do is we get the integral from 0 to omega 1 of omega 2 times um, d log of z, sorry, d log of f of z, um, times 1 over 2 pi i. And now this thing here um, just um, increases, so, so, so log of f of z increases by a multiple of 2 pi i. That's because um, f of z has period omega 1. So f of z is the same here as it is here. So if you look at what log of f of z does, it must increase by multiple of 2 pi i. So this integral here is an integer multiple of um, omega 2. And in exactly the same way, if you take this integral minus this integral, this gives you an integral multiple of omega 1. So we see that 1 over 2 pi i times this integral of z f prime z over f c dz is equal to some integer times omega 1 plus some integer times omega 2, which is an element of the lattice L we started with. So we now have this extra condition that if sum of n i p i is the divisor of some doubly periodic function f, then um, sum of n i p i equals naught in C over L. And I've, this notation is a bit confusing because this means a divisor. Here I'm taking um, the PI to be the basis of a free abelian group. And here I'm actually adding them up in C. So we think of PI as being an element of C and adding them up as complex numbers. And of course, um, PI is a zero of an elliptic function, and that's only defined modulo L. So this sum is only defined modulo L. So we can't really say what it is in C. It's only, a, it's only an element of C modulo L, but it has to be zero. Um, so, so we get a map from the degree zero divisors modulo the principal divisors, maps onto C over L. So there's a non-trivial obstruction to finding an elliptic function with given poles and zeros, even if we um, say the total number of poles is the same as the number of zeros. In fact, this is an isomorphism. And I'll just sketch the proof of this using some classical facts about elliptic functions. So what we want to do is to show that given um, a degree zero divisor, we want to find an elliptic function which has those as its poles and zeros. So let's just have a quick review of elliptic functions. This is going to be a very quick review with most details missing. You could easily spend several hours giving the, the details of this. First of all, we have the famous Weierstrass elliptic function defined by rho of z is sum of lambda in L of 1 over z minus lambda all squared which is obviously double periodic, except it isn't because unfortunately the sum doesn't actually converge. But if it did converge, it would obviously be doubly periodic because you're summing over all elements of L. So what you do is you twiddle it a bit. So this is one over Z squared plus sum of lambda in L 
of one over z minus lambda squared. And now you sort of subtract this fudge factor minus one over lambda squared. Now that makes it converge. Um, unfortunately, there's a slight problem. It's no longer quite so obvious that this is doubly periodic, but it's not too difficult to show it's doubly periodic. You can go and look at a book on elliptic functions. So um, the Weierstrass function has the property that rho of z equals, so it's not a rho, it's p of z equals p of z plus lambda whenever lambda is in L. Um, and now we need another um, not quite elliptic function. We need the zeta function. And the zeta function is a sort of integral of the um, Weierstrass function, except it isn't quite because this is a Tyson pole at zero. However, it's still true that the derivative of the zeta function is minus the Weierstrass function. And the zeta function is a pole of order one at zero. And before you get too excited about the Riemann zeta function, this is not the Riemann zeta function and has nothing to do with the Riemann zeta function. It's a completely different zeta function. And the Weierstrass function is doubly periodic, but when you integrate it, it's no longer doubly periodic because you pick up these constants of integration. We find that the zeta of omega 1 plus c is zeta of z plus an integration constant, which is sometimes called eta of 1, and the same for zeta of omega 2. And that's still not enough. What we need is the sigma function. And the sigma function is sort of given by um, e to the integral of zeta of z dz. Well, except it's not quite because this integral doesn't really converge if you start integrating at zero. And sigma function actually has zero, so it can't be e to the anything. But it still has the property that um, the derivative of the log of sigma of z is equal to zeta of z. And sigma is even less periodic than zeta. If you unwind it, you find that sigma of z plus omega 1 is equal to minus e to the eta 1 of z plus omega 1 over 2 times sigma of z. So it's um, almost periodic, except you've got this funny, extra, more complicated fudge factor. And zeta of z plus omega 2 is equal to something similar. Um, well, um, so these are used to be standard elliptic function formulas. And back in the 19th century, every undergraduate, every mathematics undergraduate at British universities was thoroughly trained in all this. And you may think this was a bit of a silly thing to train people to do. But I will just point out that at that time, Britain had the world's largest empire and the decline of the British empire coincides exactly with the time that elliptic functions were removed from the undergraduate syllabus. Um, anyway, having done all these, we can now find an elliptic function with given poles and zeros. So suppose we've got a divisor, sum of n i p i. What we do is we look at the product of sigma of z minus pi the ni. And let's call this f of z. And it certainly has zeros at pi, because I forgot to say that sigma of naught is equal to naught. And um, the question is, is this doubly periodic? Well, let's work out f of zeta plus omega 1. Well, this is equal to f of zeta times a product of all these fudge factors we got from sigma, which is a product of minus x of eta 1 z minus a p1 times n i. And um, this factor is equal to 1 if sum of the ni equals naught and um, the sum of ni 
pi equals naught in C. Um, so um, if you pick the pi, so that their sum is actually naught in C and not just naught in lambda, then this is a doubly periodic function. So f is an elliptic function with divisor sum of n i p i. So what we've done is we've shown that we get an exact sequence We get an exact sequence. Naught goes to C over L, goes to divisors, modulo principal divisors, goes to Z, goes to zero. And an awful lot of the classical theory of elliptic functions is sort of follows from this exact sequence. What, what this does is it tells you exactly when you can find an elliptic function with given poles and zeros, the obstructions of the degree and this funny group here. And this is called the Jacobian of the elliptic curve. And you may think it's a bit silly to call it the Jacobian of an elliptic curve because it actually is the elliptic curve. Um, the point is, if you replace the elliptic curve by some more complicated curve, then what you get here is not the curve, which isn't even a group in general, but something that looks like this only in higher dimensions, and it's called the Jacobian of the curve. And um, what we want to do is to generalize this to higher dimensional varieties. So we want to figure out what we mean by divisor in higher dimensions. In fact, in fact there, are, there are two plausible versions of what a divisor might be. You can either think of a divisor as being something like the zero, locally like the zeros of a function. These are, and the analogs are called Cartier divisors. which look like zeros of functions. Or we can get things called V divisors. You might think of the divisors as being a sort of union of co-dimension one irreducible subsets. So, so these correspond to co-dimension one irreducible subsets. So for non-singular curves, Cartier divisors and Vey divisors are more or less the same, but in general, they're slightly different. Um, so in high dimensions, this bit here will sometimes at least turn out to be something called the Picard variety. And this bit here will turn out to be something called the neron Severi group. So there's a, um, there's a sort of discrete group sitting here and a, and a connected group sitting here. And the connected group quite often turns out to be an algebraic variety um, in its own right. Um, so um, next lecture, we're going to start discussing um, how you generalize the notion of divisor in higher dimensions and also what it has to do with invertible sheaves.